The International Prize in Statistics is considered the top award in the field of statistics. This year, it was recently awarded to biostatistician Professor Nan Laird. It's very important to our profession to have a big award like this and it's very meaningful to me as well. Nan spent more than four decades at Harvard University, working her way to the top of the biostatistics department at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health until her recent retirement. She has seen a lot over the years from when she first entered Harvard in the early 1970s as a PhD candidate. I don't think for some reason people took women as seriously as students, as if they didn't believe that they were going to go out and have serious careers. But a serious career is exactly what Nan had, and few people have had as much impact as she has. Among other things, Nan helped develop the statistical methods that allow researchers to extract detailed information from longitudinal studies. These are large studies that follow participants and collect their data over time, sometimes for many decades. In the mid-80s, she served on the government panel that decided that smoking should be banned on airliners. I think I was too naive to really understand, first of all, why were all these objections, because it's obvious that this is what you have to do. And I was too naive to understand that there might be a lot of political backlash. But that didn't stop her. In this episode, Nan talks about her career, the impact she's had, and we even chat with one of her former students turned colleague, Harvard professor Garrett Fitzmaurice. What Nan does with everybody who works her is she brings out their best. We celebrate the International Prize in Statistics with professors Nan Laird and Garrett Fitzmaurice. Welcome to The Random Sample, a podcast by the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence for Mathematical and Statistical Frontiers. I'm Emily Duane. In this show, we share stories about mathematics, statistics and the people involved. You can learn more about what the centre does by visiting our website, asems.org.au. That's A-C-E-M-S Our host for this episode is UTS Distinguished Professor and ASIMS Chief Investigator, Louise Ryan. I'm Louise Ryan and I'm one of the ASEMS Chief Investigators. I'm really delighted to be hosting this podcast, interviewing Professor Nan Laird, who's just been announced as the 2021 winner of the International Prize in Statistics. Some people refer to it as the Nobel Prize in Statistics, and it's supported by a consortium of five international statistics organizations, including the Royal Statistical Society, the American Statistical Association, the Institute of Mathematical Statistics, the International Biometric Society, and the International Statistics Institute. Nan is only the third winner, the first being David Cox for his work on the proportional hazards model, and the second, Bradley Efron, for his work on the bootstrap. So that tells you something about the caliber of the award. Now, Nan has made a number of foundational contributions to statistical science, but it was her work on longitudinal modelling that was the basis for the award. We'll put some links on our ASEMS website so you can read some more detail. But briefly, after earning her PhD from the Harvard Statistics Department in 1975, she joined the Department of Biostatistics in the Harvard School of Public Health as an assistant professor. She thrived there throughout her entire career until retiring and becoming the Harvey V. Feinberg Professor of Biostatistics Emerita in 2019. I vividly recall the powerful impact Nan had on me almost 40 years ago when I started as a postdoc in the Biostatistics Department. In those days, it was rare to see a highly successful woman in our field, so she was a real inspiration to me. She still is. So it is a great pleasure to interview her today for this podcast. Joining us is Professor Garrett Fitzmaurice, who did his PhD under Nan's guidance in the early 90s, and Garrett is now a Harvard professor himself. We'll be hearing from Garrett about his experience of working with Nan, but first, he and I will be asking her a few questions. So I'll start out. So Nan, congratulations. Can you tell us about the award and what it means to you? How did you feel when you got that phone call telling you you had been selected as the winner? Thank you, Louise, and, and thank you for your congratulations and all that you have done and Garrett to make this possible. I remember when you first mentioned to me the idea 
of nominating me for the award, I went off and read about the award and I said, no, you know, I'm not, I'm really not qualified. And I, so you and I had this discussion, (laughs) I'm not qualified. Don't waste your time, Louise. But, you know, you're a very persuasive and creative person, Louise, and, and can mobilize other people to think that way. So I, I, I am very grateful to what you have done to make this award to me come true. It's, it is an extremely um, gratifying award to receive at this time in my life. You mentioned when I got the phone call, no, I, uh, you know, like most Americans today, I don't answer the phone unless I recognize the phone number. And so I was ignoring the phone calls from Guy Nason, who was the chair of the committee. And then he wrote me some nice emails, but very nonspecific. And I ignored those too, because I couldn't imagine why he was writing to me. And finally I thought, well, no, I really should answer this email. And so uh, we connected and as soon as we connected on the phone, I realized what the award was about. And it's it's very meaningful. It's very important to our profession um, to have a big award like this. And uh, it's very meaningful to me as well. So, so Nan, first of all, um, I too would also like to congratulate you on, on receiving uh, the International Prize in Statistics. I think um, all of us who have sort of worked with you um, really know that how, how richly uh, you, d- you deserve the award. And we're all sort of in some ways basking in, <laughs> in your achievement um, ju- ju- just by association. We, you know, um, we're, we're so proud. Of, of all the achievements uh, in your career, and, and this is really a sort of a fitting um, uh, recognition of that. Um, Louise nicely mentioned your career path. In thinking about it, it's actually been 50 years since you were a, a doctoral student, first in the statistics department at Harvard, and then you joined the faculty in the biostatistics department at the School of Public Health, where you rose through the faculty ranks from, from a junior faculty member to a senior uh, to a tenured professor. Uh, you were also chair of the department for, for 10 years and uh, currently you're, you're a professor emerita. So you've had this 50 year longitudinal span at Harvard and in, in different roles, both as a graduate student right through being a chair of a department. And that must have given you lots of different perspectives on the university. And I wonder if you have any sort of reflections about that that you'd like to share with us. Well, I, I certainly have a lot of wonderful memories of my time which at, at Harvard, which was a very long span. Um, but of course, I also, my sphere of knowledge about Harvard was pretty limited in the sense that I pretty much stuck with the statistics department during my time as a student and then at the School of Public Health. I really loved being a, a, stu- a grad student in the statistics department. It was, it was quite small then. Uh, there were only a few full professors, uh, William Cochran, Art Dempster, Fred Mosteller, uh, all of whom were pretty influential in their own way for me, especially Art, and uh, who I ended up working on for my PhD, and and Fred, who um, who I worked for, and I I you know it's it was a totally different atmosphere I think from the way it is to be a PhD student at Harvard now because back then it was uh, the students were not automatically funded there wasn't a limitation into only accepting students that you can fund and a lot of us myself were included were self funded and being self funded I think was a big boost you. You knew why you were there, uh, and you you could take advantage of doing what you wanted to do. And I, I felt 
that we were all in control of what we were doing while we were there. And the Stat Department was a very good place to be then. When I first went to um, the School of Public Health, to be, to be completely honest, I, uh, it, it, I did receive some other job offers, but I had a family. I didn't really want to move, and this was the best job offer I had to go to the School of Public Health. After, after I sort of participated in a number of projects and got to know what was going on to the school, at the school, I enjoyed it much more. I had some wonderful junior colleagues, um, Jim Ware, Tom Lewis, uh, Christine Waterno. These were people who were a lot like myself, and we worked together and had a lot of fun. And of course, Marvin Zellin came to be the department chair pretty soon, and he really changed the biostatistics department from kind of a sleepy little backwater department to a world-class biostat department. And he had a great vision for what he wanted to do, and he also had great vision for how uh, he wanted to include the faculty in doing things. So. Uh, I, I really enjoyed the time that Marvin was chair. Then I became chair as Garrett, as she said, and that was kind of a, it's t Marvinism was a real tough act to follow. Uh, but I had some things that I, I wanted to accomplish. I, th I think what I felt about our department at that time was we had a very a large number of uh, projects going on, the um, the cancer clinical trials at the Farber and also the AIDS clinical trials at the school. And well, I feel that the thing I wanted to accomplish as department chair was to make sure that every faculty member had a certain amount of time, at least uh, one or two days a week, that they could devote to their own research interests for the first few years. Nan, just also follow up on that. I I'm, I'm curious about your impressions over that 50 year span of the role of women at Harvard. Mm -hmm. Have, has mm -hmm. your perception, is your perception that it's changed a lot over the years in terms of prominence and Yes, I, I think so, Louise. I, um, you know, after I came to Harvard as a PhD student, while I was still a PhD student in that department, Someone, and I won't mention his name, he told me that uh, there were, at the time that I applied to Harvard, and I applied for a scholarship as well, that there was a guy who applied at the same time, and people were torn as to whether or not they should give the scholarship to me or to him. And um, they finally, they decided the credentials were all equal, but they thought, well, she'll just go off and get married and become a housewife. So we're <laughs> going to give it to him. Uh, so I, I suppose that's not the worst reason in the world for turning down, <laughs> being turned down for a scholarship. I suppose it would be worse to be told, oh, she wasn't smart enough. But I don't think that would really happen anymore. I think I that think so. When I was in grad school, you know, and it's always been true that there are a lot of women in grad school in statistics and biostatistics, at least 50%. And this has been true as long as I've looked at the data, which is 50 years now. But I don't think for some reason people took women as seriously as students. I think they were willing to accept them as students, but didn't take them quite as seriously as if they didn't believe that they were going to go out and have serious careers. I think that's changed completely. I yeah. don't get the impression that that's true anymore at all. I think female students are taken quite seriously and, and have all of the same privileges and respect that the male graduate students do. I think um, when I came to Harvard, School of Public Health, well, in the stat department, there were no faculty, no women faculty, and that's changed. Um, when I came to the School of Public Health, there were many more women. Several of the departments at the School of Public Health had women as department chairs. So there were women 
at the senior levels at the School of Public Health, I think the big difference is they didn't have families. They didn't have children. They didn't have spouses or partners. I, they may well have had partners, uh, um, but 50 years ago, people didn't talk about their partners as much. So, And they didn't have that support system that you get from your family. Yeah. Um, whereas that's no longer true. Now, there are plenty of women, there are a lot of tenured women in our department who have families, as well as tenured men who have families. And I think that's a, been a very important change. Actually, Nan, I'm reminded of a funny story. I don't know if you remember this. We had a big event. It was honoring uh, a, a certain very well-respected male professor who shall remain nameless. He was giving a speech, it was a big dinner, and he said, oh, I, I like to acknowledge my wife. I don't know how young people do it today without wives to help them. And you just piped up from the audience and, she, and you said, well, Fred, today we have husbands. <laughs> I don't know. I remember that. <laughs> it was very funny. <laughs> um, great, uh, let's switch over and talk about the science a little bit. I'm curious, when you were in the stats department, what did you know about biostatistics and how did that happen that you ended up in biostatistics? The write-up that the ASA uh, posted about the award said that uh, you were actually quite eager to find a way to use your maths in real world settings. So was that the first time you realized that you could use mathematics and statistics oh, to solve yes, so problems? That's interesting, Louise. What that refers to is, you know, I'm one of the few people in the world who has an undergraduate major in statistics. And I, I got it back when I was an undergraduate at University of Georgia. I had taken a few years off from school. Uh, I started out at Rice. I started out in math at Rice, and that didn't work out so well, so I went to French. Then I took several years off, and when I started back in school at University of Georgia, I decided I wanted to do something really practical. And so I decided to go into computers. I had heard about computers, but really, this was an, um, well, I'm trying to think when this must have been, in the late, very late 60s. Computers were only beginning to be part of universities. And so I thought, well, this would be very practical. I'll become a computer programmer because I, I wanted to get a job and I wanted to work in some kind of scientific field. So I thought I'll be a computer programmer. But um, so I went to talk to the head of the statistics department and he said, the and statistics department only because the computer computer science was nested in statistics. And I told him I wanted to do a degree, my get my degree in statistics, although I was already a third year student in French and had very little math. And he said, well, that's okay. We can deal with that. But I think you should take my course as an introduction to statistics and computer science. So I said, okay. And his course actually was not about statistics, and it wasn't about computer science. It was a course taught from Herman Chernoff's book on elementary decision sciences. And that's all about how you can use mathematics and simple probabilities to make decisions like, should I take my umbrella to work today or not? And to me, I thought, well, this is fabulous. You can actually use mathematical principles to make decisions about how to do very practical things. So that's what got me hooked on it. And I took ah. a few computer courses and realized that was not for me. And then I took some statistics and really enjoyed the statistics. Um, and then after that, I worked for a couple of years and then applied for the PhD program. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then the rest is the rest is history. The rest is history. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, ma'am, um, I think many statisticians who are listening to the podcast um, are already very familiar with um, lots of areas of, of your statistical research. You know, starting from 
the early work you did on uh, the EM algorithm, which as, as many statisticians know, it's probably one of the most highly cited statistical papers. I think it's in the top 100 most highly cited papers in science. Um, they'll also be familiar with your work on longitudinal analysis, um, the work you did with Jim Ware, which was actually the basis for, for um, receiving the, the International Prize in Statistics. You also have uh, some incredibly highly cited papers in other areas, work you did with Re Rebecca Tersimonian on meta-analysis, um, your work on missing data, your work on statistical genetics. But, but outside of those statistical areas where I think statisticians are very, very familiar with your contributions, you've also made important contributions in, in other areas. And one that caught my attention was um, a project that you got involved in, um, a National Academy of Science report on airline cabin environment. Um, and so I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how you got involved in that report, um, what its recommendations were, and I believe they actually have some long-term consequences for, 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 for public health. Yes. Um, so this was quite a while ago, Garrett. I'm not sure I really remember the dates on that. Probably the early 80s. There was a time when the National Academy of Sciences would set up these commissions to study certain problems. And how this particular one came about was the uh, union of stewards, air stewards and stewardesses were very concerned about the quality of air and airplanes because this was a time when due to the expense of fuel and due to the expense of bringing in fresh air to an airplane, which meant if you're, you're up in the sky and you have to bring in fresh airplane, it's air, it's very cold, so you have to heat it, and then you have to recool it before you can send it through the system. So it was very expensive to bring in fresh air, and they hit on recirculating air in airplanes, and this caused a lot of issues for people, especially the people who worked on the planes. And the Senate actually got interested in this and, and commissioned a study to be done on air quality in airplanes. And the National Academy appointed some scientists to work on it. And there, I was the only statistician. There was an epidemiologist from Hopkins named Genevieve Matnowski. And we were really the only two numerical scientists. The rest were MDs or people from air quality. Jack Spengler was on the committee. And I remember right in the beginning, it was obvious that um, smoking was an issue on the airplanes, and especially since you're no longer using fresh air, you're using recirculated air. What the airlines had done was make smoking sections back by the galleys, so that's why it was particularly intense for the, the stewards and stewardesses. And uh, Genevieve Matnowski's and my job was to look at all of the studies that had been done on side stream smoking. That is, uh, what are the eff effects of being exposed to other people smoking? So anyway, it was, it was a very educational experience. And in the end, we were sitting around the table trying to decide what were we going to say in the report and what the recommendations were going to be. Well, it seemed obvious to me that you had to recommend no smoking in airplanes. And there were a couple of other people. I think Genevieve Matnowski was one. And also there was another woman on the committee named Harriet Burgess, who subsequently came to the uh, Harvard School of Public Health. And I think we all felt, it's obvious, you're going to have to make a recommendation against smoking on airplanes. But a lot of the people who were much, much more savvy than we were, they they were very skeptical. They thought, well, 
the airline industry is going to hate this. The smoking industry is going to hate this. It's going to be a big political mess. The Congress will have this mess on their hands. We don't think we should do it. So we, but we, we came to the conclusion that it was necessary. And I think I was too naive to really understand, first of all, why were all these objections? Because it's obvious that this is what you have to do. And I was too naive to understand that there might be a lot of political backlash. But the fact of the matter is, I don't recall uh, I don't recall anything from the airline, in, uh, sorry, from the tobacco industry. There probably was, but the airlines loved it. The other passengers loved it. Congress loved it. It's a nice, simple thing to do. It's not expensive. It doesn't cost anything. So, and pretty soon the ban extended from just American uh, internet, uh, American flights within the U.S. to international flights and to other airlines as well. So that's been something which at the time I I didn't realize what lasting impact it would have, but it was very gratifying. Throughout your career at the School of Public Health, you've also been involved in in lots of other interesting projects. Um, I know you were involved in an important study of adverse events that can happen during hospitalization. Um, You've been involved in studies of childhood obesity, You've been involved in lots of genetic studies of, of Alzheimer's disease, bipolar, asthma, lung, lung diseases. Uh, you've been an important um, member of, of, of uh, a study called the Sterling County Study. So is, is, do, you, do you have any sort of favorites? The, uh, the work I did with Rebecca Dare Simonian on um, meta-analysis, I, that I very much enjoyed. And... And again, that, that came out of, I think, Fred Mosteller's influence. He was, he, was very, he, he was very interested in the social sciences, and meta-analysis kind of arose in the social sciences originally back in the 80s. And he got, and Rebecca had been working with him, but she came to do her thesis with me, and she brought with her a, a set of, of data that uh, Mosteller had her working on having to do with the scholastic aptitude test or the SATs. And um, it's a long story, which I won't really go into here, but to say that there were two people from Harvard Medical School who were interested, had a vested interest to show that the scholastic aptitude test really was not an aptitude test because you could show that if students received coaching for the test, they could improve their scores. And if it were a true aptitude test, then studying for it or getting coached for it shouldn't actually increase your scores very dramatically. So they had painstakingly collected a vast array of studies but the um, Educational Testing Service publishes these statistics that one can use to estimate what, what you would expect people to gain on the basis of just maturity over a period of before and after. So they could estimate a gain, and um, then they could calculate the amount achieved, which would be over and above what was expected. And so they had calculated all of the results for all of these studies. There were probably 15 to 18 studies, but they were the, the answers were just all over the place. Some of them achieved basically nothing. Some of them achieved 50 to 100 points. It was a huge variety. And so when you looked at it and you calculated standards error, it's pretty clear that there was a lot more going on the, these investigators at the medical school had simply taken a simple average and said, oh, we get a gain of 50 points and a tiny standard error. So therefore, the aptitude test is really not an aptitude test. But So what Rebecca and I were interested in is here you have these studies which are all supposed to show you something about the same concept namely does coaching 
improve your aptitude. And But they're giving you remarkably different answers. How's the best way to describe what the results are? So that sort of led us to use a random effects kind of a model where we look separately at the different types of studies according to their control and how they were conducted and and various things and and just simply didn't use it so much to draw conclusions as to say look you can't be so simplistic about combining these studies when they're all so different from one another but it it was apparently a very sexy topic it got picked up by the uh, journal at the the ed, ed schools and and so it 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 appeared in, the revolts appeared in a lot of different newspapers so we got a lot of interest in that so nan uh maybe shift uh, shift tack here a little bit um anybody who knows you is well aware of your great passion for mentoring students and and young scholars and a lot of your students have done extremely well and it seems like they've been a great source of joy and satisfaction for you. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about this. Do you have a particular philosophy or an approach to mentoring? Why do you think it's always appealed to you so much to work with uh, young scholars? I learned so much from Fred Mosteller uh, about how to be a statistician. He had a a tremendous influence on my education. I mean, he just sort of took me in hand and introduced me to people and introduced me to problems and introduced me to committees. And, you know, at the time, I think I just accepted that as, okay, that's what you're supposed to do. But then I realized that's not true. Not everybody was fortunate to have a mentor like that. It's just that he had a way of caring about the whole person's development as a academic scholar that was pretty striking and that I really could identify with. Uh, and I think another person who had a big influence in my life in that way was Marvin. I never wrote anything with Marvin. Uh, but again, Marvin was very, very interested in young faculty and interested to help, me, help them develop in a kind of a holistic way. So I guess I have tried to, to do the same for many of my students. Yeah, that's great. Um, that's great. It makes, it makes a lot of sense, Nan. Well, it's actually because of your, your passion and, and your great skills, actually, in mentoring that we decided to invite Garrett to be part of the podcast. So Garrett, I'd like to hear a little bit more from you. So how was it that you found yourself working with Nan for your PhD? And what was it like? What 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 did she do to bring out the best in you? Because you've had a, an amazing career yourself. So tell us a little bit more about that. Right. So I, I'm trying to remember back. So I think it was about 1991. Um, and the the I had passed my qualifying exams. I think we took them in the winter period. And then typically what students would do in the biostatistics department is they'd, they'd go shopping for a, for a thesis advisor. Um, I knew of Nan by reputation. Um, I actually hadn't had a course with Nan, so Nan hadn't been uh, an instructor for any course. Louise, I think you had been. I um, think so, yeah. in, in my first <laughs> In my, my first semester. So, so, so Nan did not know me. Um, I knew of Nan by reputation, that she had this amazing reputation for being an outstanding um, biostatistician, but also she had this amazing reputation uh, for being a thesis advisor. So she was definitely on my radar, uh, and I hope Nan isn't going to be disappointed to hear. She wasn't the only person on my radar. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think I went around, you know, shopping for, for um, both a thesis advisor and a, a thesis topic. And I landed in Nan's office, and um, my recollection is that Nan had this interesting problem. Um, it had to do with uh, the analysis of longitudinal binary data, mm. and I think she described it to me, and then maybe we met a second time, and, and Nan had sort of scribbled 
some ideas down on a piece of paper and she sort of quickly went through it and I understood about half of what she had told me <laughs> but it seemed really interesting so I continued to meet with Nan and I remember at one point it was sort of you know are we having coffee or, or is this a real date you know I, I, <laughs> there, 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 there was no formal process I think at that time because I was in the midst of my spring semester I, there wasn't the issues of sort of funding changing and I, I think I had this sort of insecurity would Nan really want to work with me and I, I don't know if Nan remembers but, I, but I, I remember going early on you know maybe it was our second or third time meeting and I said sort of like well Nan will you take me on and she, she agreed and that, that was sort of a great relief and then you know I, I sort of realized I hit the jackpot you, you asked the right question, Louise, when you sort of said, you know, what does Nan, what did Nan do to sort of bring out the best? I mean, mm. I, I, I can try to answer it, but, but I think it's the right question. What Nan does with everybody who works with her is she brings out their yeah. best. And, um, you know, as, as I sort of think about it, it, it it's, it's a combination of a number of things. You know, first of all, Nan's very inspiring. Um, she you, is you indeed. You can't be you know you can't be around her without just being inspired that that you know you you would like to be you know even in her shadow <laughs> um, and nan also sets um high standards um, she has high expectations um high expectations and standards of her own work um but you know although she sets a high high expectations she's not it's not in a in a stressful demanding way it, it's in a way that um, she believes that you can do your best and that sort of inspires you to really to really try and sort of um, you know up the ante and, and sort of improve your game and, 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 and that's what I think Nan does very successfully it, it, I, I, I can't describe it in a, a sort of a mechanical breaking it down into, into pieces but um, you know for me, for me it's just when you work with Nan you want to do your best yeah. And yeah. you also feel that Nan believes you can do it. And that, that really sort of helps motivate you. So as I say, you know, I, I hit the jackpot. I didn't just get a, a, a thesis advisor, you know, somebody who, who had a track record of being, um, uh, you know, very, very successful of, of, of getting students through, through their, their, their doctoral degree, but really... Um, I ended up with, with, uh, with a mentor who's been invaluable throughout my career in so many different ways. So I guess we'll move towards wrapping up now. Um, Nan, a as we wrap up, I I'd like to hear just a little bit more about your family. I you've mentioned them several times, and I know that they've been a massive source of support and encouragement for you over the years, so they must be very proud of you. So can you just say a little bit more about that? Well, um, thank you, Louise, for this opportunity. <laughs> you know, I, I think my husband, Joel, has been enormously helpful. Uh, yeah. And, you know, there are just many times I have thought, well, without his support and his willingness to go the extra mile, uh, this I would not have been able to have the career that I have. That's for sure. And so, you know, one piece of advice is think, choose your spouse carefully. And I think this is really true for both men and women. Um, yeah. To to have someone very supportive who's who's going to stand by you when you really need it. I think it's also really important to have a good babysitter. Uh, <laughs> and that good babysitter should not be overlooked. We had a wonderful woman. Who took care of our daughter um, for many years, and and she was she was like a mother to the whole household, and that was that was very helpful. As far as my children, I think my children are very proud of me. I tended not to uh, drag them into the limelight. So, any final words, then, like if, if for a, a young person starting out today who wants to try to, you know have even a, a, a shadow of the great career that you have had, what, what would your advice be? I think you should do what you love to do. I 
I always followed my heart on decisions about what to do next because if you try and do what you think is the right thing to do, that that can easily backfire on you. And I always used to find when I was advising junior faculty especially, sometimes, uh, you know, junior faculty are just not quite the right fit. And they come and they find that they really love applied statistics and they love analyzing data and they love working with people. But they've been told that if they don't write research papers, they're not going to get promoted. And I, I've always advised people to do what they like to do. I think it'll be more rewarding in the end than to try and spend all your time doing something that you aren't doing very well because you don't like what you're doing. And I, I think that goes hand in hand, that if you like what you're doing, you're going to be better at it that if you're trying to do something that you're not enjoying. Yeah, no, that that's great. Uh, look, I think we should probably wrap up now. I really appreciate the time of both of you. Nan, uh, congratulations again on your award and thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. And Garrett, thank you as well for taking the time to be part of the podcast today. I've really Pleasure. enjoyed. You, oh yeah, I've really enjoyed the you know hearing the 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 perspectives, learning more about Nan through Garrett's eyes as as a former student. It's really been very interesting and. Nan, uh, we, as Garrett said before, we're all really proud of you. And I think there is definitely that sense we're all basking in your glory right now. So <laughs> Thank you. it really is wonderful. And um, I'm, I'm very proud of you as well. You, you are certainly an inspiration to all of us. So thank you very much. Well, and, thank you, Louise. Um, and thank you, Garrett, too. I, I, I've really enjoyed this as well. And I appreciate your kind remarks. Thank you for listening to The Random Sample, a podcast brought to you by the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence for Mathematical and Statistical Frontiers. If you like what you heard, please rate us on iTunes because we think stories about maths and stats are worth sharing and we want others to discover that as well. You can learn more about what we do at acems.org.au. That's A-C-E-M-S And you can find us on social media by searching at Ace Math Stats. That's at A-C-E Math Stats. We'll see you next week with another story from within ASIMS. Bye for now.